good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending my talk. So I think you will agree with me that research, uh, the scientific process is a creative process, and obviously the outcome will depend on the personality of the creator. So I'd like to start this talk by <clears throat> simply using an analogy of different personality types from another discipline, which I like a lot, and that is music. So I'd like to explore the spectrum of different personality types. And on the one end of the spectrum, you have people like Arnold Schoenberg. So just to hear a bit what is his music like. So his music is about intellectual beauty and elegance, shall we say, and also about rules and control. So Schoenberg invented this direction in music, 12-tone music or serialism, where, for example, it's all about the rules. You set a particular set of musical notes, let's say, and then you have to use them in precisely that order. And he didn't really care about what the great unwashed will say about his music. Actually, it is said that at his concerts, he would bow to the orchestra, but not to the public. So you had to be educated to really appreciate his music. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people like John Coltrane. So maybe cover your ears depending on the... So as you can see, this can't be couldn't be different <clears throat> from what we heard a while ago. So here it's all about direct experience and it's about improvisation. So you don't really care about the rules. It's about what feels natural at a particular point. And he was also completely different in the sense that he wanted actually people to appreciate his music. So, okay, this actually comes back in research and in particular in artificial intelligence, which is the field where I'm conducting most of my research. And since the mid 70s, there is this tension between the so-called meets and the scruffies. And there is even a Wikipedia page where you can read a bit more about it. So on the one hand, <coughs> you've got the neats who appreciate elegance and clarity. So the, the solution, it's not enough that it just works, but it should also be elegant and nice. There is some inherent beauty in a particular kind of solution. These people also appreciate provable correctness. <coughs> so it's not sufficient that a piece of software just works, but you also want to know that it will work under all possible uh, inputs. And by necessity, then, you, this means that you focus on uh, logic and formal methods. It's about declarative solutions. So you specify what the problem is in some higher level language, and then you use some general purpose solving, uh, problem solving method to actually arrive at your uh, solution. And obviously the focus is more on theory. Whereas on the other hand, you have the so-called scruffies, which <coughs> maintain that intelligence is too complex to be described elegantly, clearly, and proved correct. So this basically means that we need to use ad hoc methods, which basically means hacking. <coughs> so you write a piece of uh, code, you tweak it until it works, and then you've solved the problem. These people propose more procedural solutions. So instead of specifying what the problem is and so on, you just write a procedure and that is your solution. And they are much more focused on actual practice. And it turns out that artificial intelligence can be broadly divided into you know, needs and scruffies. And those communities are often disjoint with even separate conferences. And there is quite a bit of tension or even animosity sometimes between these communities. And what I find quite interesting is that there is actually a lack of technical skill, skills on both sides of the divide. So <clears throat> when we talk about the needs, uh, well, they actually lack quite often engineering skills or they lack even interest in engineering skills. And you could have the best possible theoretical solution which works beautifully on your piece of paper, but you actually have to be careful when you're putting it into practice. You have to worry about the nitty gritty details. The fact is that sometimes when you talk to them, they can actually come across as, say, supercilious, so you, you feel like you're the stupidest in the room, uh, which doesn't necessarily help their cause. And the fact is that they can also work on intellectually challenging but irrelevant problems. <clears throat> on the other hand, the scruffies, they're not versed in formal thinking, so they lack a certain skill in kind of clearly describing what it's about, and especially writing theorems. They're, 
their solutions are quite often tailed to, tailored to a specific use case, which means that they are difficult to extend. So maybe the solution works for a particular problem, but then if you want to move away from the original uh, constraints, it becomes difficult to extend it. And the fact is that they sometimes, their work sometimes lacks scientific rigor, even if it's not theoretical, sometimes, for example, in evaluation and so on, there are things which uh, could be done better. Um, the point is that there is too little exchange of ideas between these two communities, which I find a shame. Um, so, <clears throat> in particular, if you talk about information systems, you might have heard of this new buzzword called big data. So, I won't go into the details of what big data is, um, but I will just say that it's either lots and lots of data or lots of complicated data. So, there are various aspects of big data and I will um, outline a bit more in the later part of my talk some concrete applications where you could see elements of big data. The point is that the problems that big data pose to modern information systems are quite challenging. And I firmly believe that you need both theory and practice in order to successfully address them. And therefore, in this talk, I will try to outline how theory and practice both played an important role in my research. And I will maybe uh, at the end also <coughs> say a bit what we could do to foster um, theory and practice, the integration of theory and practice in, let's say, university education and the work of other researchers. But before I go to the main part of my talk, um, I would just give you, like to give you my personal story, how I arrived to this integration of theory and practice. So I was doing my PhD in the group of Professor Rudi Studer, who unfortunately, in, in, at the University of Khazra, who unfortunately wasn't able to come tonight. And I was quite desperate because it, I, I'm probably more on the needs side. So I like to you know, know where things are going. And I'm sure everybody who's done a PhD, at one point you're completely lost. And I was quite, you know, what do I need to do to really get a PhD? And I asked this to uh, my supervisor and he said, PhD thesis is a cloud. And I was like, oh my goodness, how am I going to produce a cloud? You know, this was like the last thing I ever wanted to hear. So I went home completely devastated and I was determined to come up with a more objective metric. <laughs> And what I came up with was proofs per page. So the, in my case, it's 138 proofs per 233 pages, so it must be a PhD thesis. Um, obviously, this is made tongue in cheek, but the fact remains that once you produce a proof, you somehow have the feeling that you've actually accomplished an important body of scientific research. I'm not saying that this is necessarily a good metric, but this is what I've observed over and over. This is how we perceive research. And, you know, maybe there is a little bit to it. I'm, I, I wouldn't take it the whole way, basically. Um, but this is actually what then motivated me because I really wanted to know I did a PhD in the end. On the other hand, uh, you have practice. So maybe um, my first love was probably mathematics. But then my father, who's sitting here in the audience, so don't study math, you'll end up as a high school teacher. Go for something more applied. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went basically into computer science and I worked for 12 years in industry, developed my engineering skills. So that's how I ended with interest in both theory and practice in the end. And now I'm going to go to the next part of my talk where I'm going to tell you a bit about <clears throat> my research topic and uh, then we'll start exploring how this theory and practice uh, plays an important part in, in my research. So, okay, people say that Google solves all the world's problems when it comes to search. <clears throat> so recently, I was discussing so-called forgetting, which is some particular problem that we consider in, in knowledge representation, forgetting in data log with a colleague. And we weren't sure whether there are papers on forgetting in data log, quite a lot has been writ uh, written about forgetting, but not maybe in data log. So, and I was preparing this talk and you know, I just put uh, papers on forgetting in data log into Google. And here is what comes up. So at first you have something about data log recursion. So at least it's you know, something about data log, but you know, there is just some word forgetting occurs somewhere and this is why this was ranked first. 
then I have really no idea how data log has something to do with Xbox 360. I mean, it's quite interesting. Then there is a web page of a researcher from our community who actually did some research on data log. And then you've got forgetting is in you know, psycholo psychology and again, four explanations of forgetting. So as you can see, um, as I'm sure as you know, and as you've experienced yourself, um, yourselves, Google just matches keywords. And because of that, Google doesn't really understand what I, wanted, uh, what I want from it. So it doesn't understand the concepts of forgetting, the concepts of data log. What does it mean forgetting in data log and so on? So Google works well if you're looking for a proper noun. So if you're looking for a Royal Society or Roger Needham Award, you will immediately land in the right, right place. But if you have a more complicated query, and we'll see actually examples of practical applications later on <coughs> where these complicated queries naturally arise, you actually won't be able to solve this using a technology such as Google. So what is the potential solution to this problem? Well, this basically. So the idea is if Google doesn't understand our terms, let's explicitly tell it what, you know, let's explicitly annotate information with concrete terms. And uh, hopefully in that way, Google will be able to say what is what. And this can be actually formalized. So uh, the first visionary paper about this whole topic was published in the Scientific American magazine in 1999. The idea was that uh, we would have shared vocabularies, so-called ontologies, which are basically catalogs of terms with complex, def complex definitions. So for example, if you're creating, usually an ontology is about a specific domain. So for example, here you have the dog domain, and then you have various terms which describe various parts of a dog. Um, and <clears throat> it's not just about coming up with a unique name, but you also, as we will see later, um, you can also come up with the definition of what is a shoulder, the part that is, I don't know, between the ribs and elbow or something like this. Um, of course, for this to make sense, it's not good if I come, come up with one ontology and you come up with another ontology and we don't talk to each other. So we need to reuse the same ontology in different contexts. And for this, we need agreement uh, from a community of users. But hopefully once when we've achieved that, then what we can do is we can annotate information using these shared terms. And then we can, use, uh, we can ask questions using shared terms. So then I'm not actually asking just an open-ended query as I did in the slide before, but I'm precisely specifying what it is that I'm looking for. And because of that, this question can be, pro uh, this, this information can be processed automatically or at least more precisely. Now, in order for this to work, we need language standards. We need standards for encoding, for annotating this data. We need standards for expressing these kinds of ontologies. Uh, obviously, a drawing like this won't do. So the next thing I will do is I will talk a little bit about the languages that we use to achieve this vision. So what is a language? It's basically a specification that defines modeling constructs and their semantics. So it basically tells me what can I say about a particular domain? <clears throat> now, the running theme of this research into ontology languages is the so-called complex, complexity expressivity trade-off. The higher expressivity, the higher complexity of processing. We will see later where this complexity comes from. And, uh, and obviously, I mean, if the complexity is high, then we will have problems translating things into practice. And because of that, the key research question is, what combination of con constructs provides sufficient expressivity for practical applications on the one hand, but on the other hand, can be still efficiently handled in practice? And um, in the past 20 to 30 years, uh, there's been a lot of research into these questions. And now we have a detailed taxonomy of languages where some are undecidable, which means that you can prove there is no sound and complete reasoning procedure. Uh, some are intractable, some are tractable. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to now go a bit more concretely if, into different kinds of languages that we use. So, the, so there is the so-called stack of languages uh, that is currently in use. And the, the language at the bottom of the stack is called RDF, which stands for Resource Description Framework. 
So you can think of it as kind of a graph-like data model. So we have nodes for various things that we want to represent. So for example, here we have the Peter node, which represents some person called Peter. Uh, we have a node representing Oxford University, a node representing a course called Introduction to AI. And then we have links, which are in RDF lingo called triples, simply because they connect the subject, object, and the predicate. So for example, this link here intuitively means that Peter works at Oxford. Um, or Peter teaches introduction to AI. Now, this part here is the so-called data. I mean, you can make a, an analogy to databases, but then you have also nodes here which are more akin to a schema. So for example, you, can, you have a node here which represents all universities, and then you have this special link called RDF type, which says that Oxford University is a kind of university. And then you can also build hierarchies of terms. So university is a kind of educational institution, which you, represent, which you state using this link here, RDFS subclass of. So in this way, you can describe both your data and your schema. And um, this is also known, uh, so these kinds of data models were studied already in the 60s and 70s with different properties, obviously, and with different level of, let's say, formal rigor. Um, but they were known under semantic networks or semi-structured data models. <clears throat> so this is the basic way of representing structured or semi-structured data. But then, and, and already this here can be viewed as a simple ontology. So we can state that uh, a professor is a subclass of employee. But then quite often we need to go beyond these simple subclass statements, and we want to be able to express more complicated, com uh, more, more complicated relationships. Um, so for example, I'm here using a different syntax. Don't worry about the inverted E's. I'm, I'm not going to make you understand that necessarily. Uh, I'm just showing that there is a formal way for representing different kinds of statements. So the basic statements are again just class hierarchy, but then for example we can say if someone has a child, they are a parent, and we write this formally in this way. Another thing that we can do in ontologies is we can represent indeterminate information. So for example, we can say Peter has a child, some unknown child. Not we don't know the name of that person. We know that it's some person who is either male or female. So this uh, kind of representing indeterminate information is sometimes deemed to be useful because if you're trying to integrate information from different <coughs> sources uh, coming uh, on the web, then it's unlikely that you will be able to completely represent, that you will have complete information. So sometimes this idea of, of representing indeterminate information is seen as, as, as something really important that can actually help you deal with incompleteness in the sources. So, it's still debatable, you know, when a hierarchy becomes an ontology. And again, I'm not going to go necessarily into these uh, definitions. At one point, I guess, when, when these statements become sufficiently complex, then we start calling them an ontology. And again, I'm not going to go here into philosophy, really, what is an ontology. I mean, it's just a logical theory which is written in some formal way, basically. Now. This, this thing that I showed on the previous slide, the language has its name. It's called the Web Ontology Language. And it's based on knowledge representation formalisms called description logics, who were um, subject of intense research in the past 20 or 30 years. And um, most of what I told you about studying this complexity versus expressivity trade-off was done uh, within description logics. Uh, the language was standardized by the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, and in particular, there is even the second revised version of the standard that I was heavily involved with, with other people um, in, in developing it. And that, for example, incorporated the latest research results in order to improve the expressivity of the language. But maybe even more importantly, we've considerably improved the clarity and the precision of the specification. Now, <clears throat> as we will see, processing ontologies in uh, this kind of languages is quite difficult. Um, I mean, these are, so, so reasoning requires um, combinatorial, solving a com combinatorial problem. And I will show you concretely where this combinatorial explosion arises. 
Um, and in particular, the complexity of, of reasoning in OWL is something very horrible. It is non-deterministic double exponential time. So it's very, very high, basically. Um, a lot of research has uh, gone into understanding where this complexity comes from, and I will talk a, a little bit about this later. But obviously, sometimes in practice, what you want is some concrete guarantees that it's not going to go and blow up your system. And for this purpose, uh, we developed three so-called profiles, um, sometimes also called fragments. So these are basically parts of the language which, if you use only these sets of constructs, then you know that your reasoning is going to be tractable. And uh, the so-called OWL2EL profile is used quite often for modeling large terminologies. The OWL2QL profile is useful if you, if you have your legacy systems, like databases, but you want to provide an ontology veneer over it. You want to provide an ontology interface. So then you don't need to migrate your data to a completely new system. You can actually you know, put the ontology on top of your existing data. And another profile called OWL2RL, which can be implemented using rule-based systems. And <clears throat> now I'm getting to the point of, uh, to the problem of ontology reasoning. So reasoning in this case means we have our data, we have the ontology, and now we want to draw conclusions from the ontology and the data. So if I go back here, um, so Peter is a professor and the professor is a subclass of employees. So one thing which I can conclude is that Peter is an employee. The same thing here. Oxford University is a, uh, is a kind of university and university is a kind of educational institution. So therefore, I can conclude that Oxford University is an educational institution. Um, another inference that you can draw from this ontology and the data that I showed before is that Peter is a parent. And I'm going to, on the next slide, demonstrate how this can be concluded automatically. And this will show you also why reasoning is a hard problem. Um, but so what do we do? So we draw these conclusions um, and why do we do that? Well, simply because we can then enrich query answers with these derived conclusions. So for example, um, I mean, it's a very simple example. Um, if you query all educational institutions, this will return Oxford University as well without you actually having to explicitly state that Oxford University is an educational institution. And this is quite useful if you've got a lot of data, then you have to specify the minimum amount of data, which is much easier to manage. Um, and the, the system by itself really derives everything that follows from your data. Um, so that helps dealing with data complexity. You can also use reasoning to check whether your data is consistent. Uh, because if you have lots of, data, lots of data, you will not necessarily know that everything you've got in your knowledge base is, is, is what you really want to have there, and, and so on. And I will show you again uh, several examples of concrete applications where reasoning plays a key role. But before we go there, <clears throat> so how does automated reasoning really work? So I'm just going to give you a very brief example. Um, we again have our you know, RDF graph here. And I copied here the two axioms that are going to be Im important. So again, just to remind yourselves, this axiom basically means that Peter has some child who is either a man or a woman, but we don't know which. And this axiom here means that um, things having a child, which is a person, are parents. So what we want to derive here is that Peter is a parent. So this is basically where the intelligence in artificial intelligence comes from. Um, and so how do we do this? Well, we basically just follow the axioms of the ontology. So if I know that Peter has some child, and I don't see this child in the data here because I never said that Peter has a child, what I do is I basically invent some child of Peter. And so I invent a new object, I call it X. And I say, well, this X is a child of Peter. <clears throat> but now again, I have to follow this axiom here. And uh, then I basically say, OK, it's a man or a woman. Now, what I need to do is, I mean, I don't know which is true. 
So this is maybe similar to those like puzzles that you sometimes solve, you know, Sudoku or whatever, um, where you have to do reasoning by case. So you have two possibilities. Peter can be a woman, and you have to make that assumption. And uh, well, if Peter is a woman because women are a subclass of person, then you can conclude that this unknown child of Peter is also a person. But this is not the whole story. You can't, uh, and I mean, everything that has a person is a parent, so that's the next thing you could derive. But um, obviously, you have to check the other possibility as well. So the other possibility is that this X is a man, and uh, every man is a person, so therefore we derive that X is a person. And now we know that Peter, in all possibilities, Peter has a child which is a person, so therefore I derive that Peter is a parent. This is somewhat simplified. I mean, there is a lot of other things going on here, but the whole point is that, I mean, in the end what you're doing is you're somehow unfolding these ontology axioms, and you're trying to draw make this information in the ontology explicit in your data. So you're adding new facts, you're extending your data graph. But as you can see, so there were two things which can go wrong here. Well, not, not wrong, but which are difficult. So the first one is I had to introduce this X. So depending on how many such new objects I introduce, I could be introducing lots and lots of such objects. And this is one source of complexity. And the other source of complexity is I have to do this reasoning by case. So something is either this or that. And if I have lots of objects, each which has two possibilities, if I have n objects, each with two possibilities, then I have two to the power of n combinations, which is why this is actually a combinatorial algorithm. Um, and uh, it's actually x time hard even for the simplest logics. Um, <clears throat> and as I said for OWL, to its non-deterministic double exponential, simply because you might need to introduce a lot of these x's, and then you might have to go through lots of combinations of various properties. Um, this algorithm is called hypertableau. Uh, I'll come back to that. So this is something that we developed uh, at the University of Oxford, and we've developed a reasoner based on this algorithm, and this is, let's say, state of the art for complex ontology languages, for very expressive ontology languages. Um, but there are also other kinds of, al of algorithm, resolution, consequence-based, automata. They're all applicable in different uh, scenarios, and they have different properties. And part of what we do is we try to investigate which algorithm is better. OK, so this is now the background. We have ontologies. We know how to do reasoning. So what do we do with it? So I'm going to give you now a couple of examples of real-world er, applications that I was involved with. Um, and the first one is a project that I did with a company called Experience on, and the company was quite successful, and it was recent, so it was a startup in Barcelona, and uh, it got recently sold to Skyscanner, a uh, Scottish-based uh, uh, tourism search portal. So the idea of Experience on was to really realize this, you know, better Google, but this is obviously quite difficult uh, because, you know, for the general you know, for general human knowledge, you'd need a really big knowledge base covering all of human knowledge, and that we don't still know how to do that. But what they wanted to do is they wanted to improve search in tourism. And in particular, if you go to classical tourism portals like Expedia, for example, what you can do is you can say, okay, I want to go to Rome um, from these dates, and then you get a map of um, hotels, and then you have to choose yourself what hotel suits you best. Their idea was that you put in, I mean, okay, this is in Spanish simply because their main uh, site is in Spanish. Um, so you, you say something like, oops, sorry. Uh, they say something like, I want a hotel close to the Colosseum in Rome. And this, this uh, system actually understands really what you said there, and it understands it because it knows where is Rome and that Colosseum is in Rome, and it understands what it means a hotel and what it means for a hotel to be near something. And as you can see here, uh, there is Colosseum and all the hotels were ranked such that they were really close to the Colosseum. Um, so in order for them to do this, they have a lot of data about various points of interest, about hotels. They spent a lot of time engineering this knowledge. They represented using a, an extension of RDF and they use reasoning because 
For example, I could have asked, I want accommodation close to the Colosseum. And if I'm asking for accommodation, I should get hotels as well as bed and breakfasts and so on. Or for example, they need to understand what close by means. So again, they use a form of reasoning to do this kind of stuff. So a very nice application that was very successful where reasoning plays an important part. Another really nice research, uh, project that we've had was with Samsung. So Samsung wanted to provide so-called uh, context services. And context, so you have your mobile phone, your mobile phone has a lot of sensors. Depending on the sensors, you can discover the context of the user. So for example, if a user of the phone is in a shop and the phone knows that you are running out of milk, then you basically remind the user to buy milk. Or for example, if via Bluetooth, the phone uh, sees that you're close to your friend and in your calendar, um, you see that this friend has a birthday today, then the phone may ring and say, oh, congratulate your friend the birthday. So <clears throat> their idea, the idea of Samsung was basically that you can describe this context declaratively. So instead of using a procedural solution, if in shop and this and that, um, and writing it all down in Java, they wanted to have a declarative solution where you basically specify how do you interpret sensor readings to discover various contexts? And then depending on the context, how, what, what, what action you then really uh, do. And uh, you do this using an ontology, and then you use reasoning to detect the current context from the current sensor readings and to actually suggest a course of action. And uh, this was a nice project. A particular challenge was because the sensor readings change from second to second. I mean, you're driving somewhere and your position changes cons continuously. Um, so one thing was we had to come up with a way to um, handle these changes very quickly. Um, and obviously, this was supposed to run on a mobile phone, which has limited computational resources. Another application, also an industrial application, was with EDF Energy in Paris. So it turns out that in France, energy companies are required to produce customized energy saving advice for their, cons uh, for their consumers. And for that, obviously, you could also hard code a bunch of rules, what to suggest in which situation. But their idea was, again, that they wanted a declarative solution where you describe customer situations in RDF. So here you have a customer and then you describe a kind of house that the customer lives in and the house has air conditioning as in located in a particular region of France and then you have weather information and then you take all this in um, and then you again have an ontology which basically tells you how to interpret all this data and then you use reasoning to actually come up with the actual tip for the customer that is then actually printed on their uh, bill. And as far as I know, there are currently 200,000 trial customers who are using the service and they're actually getting their advice computed using these kinds of techniques. And now, there is a research project that we have. Um, so, this is so all these were real like industrial projects, whereas this is more uh, an EU-funded research project. Um, whose subject is information integration, and one domain is gas and oil. And this is with a Norwegian company called Statoil. Um, so Statoil have a lot of data about exploration, so a lot of geological data, or about production. So these are two different scenarios, actually, exploration and production. And this is a prototypical big data application. So you have lots of data. Uh, which is very complex, so there are thousands and thousands of different tables in various relational databases. All this data is distributed uh, across many different systems, and as a consequence, um, when, for example, people want to decide where to explore for more oil, um, it can take weeks to formulate queries to actually get the information from these databases. And even, you know, just exploring the data, just browsing it, uh, maybe you find something interesting, is also quite difficult uh, because of this distribution. So the goal is to actually try to integrate all this data, but this has to be done within their IT infrastructure. So they're not obviously going to replace all this with a bunch of reasoners in the back end. So we had to find a way to actually put reasoning and bring ontologies and reasoning on top of their existing infrastructure. 
And uh, there seems to be quite a lot of potential for impact because all of this is translates in the end in, in, into real money. And then the final application field um, is healthcare and life sciences. So you might have heard of the SNOMED CT ontology. So CT stands for Taxonomy of Clinical Terms. It's an ontology developed by an international consortium of, uh, I think, 25 countries. It contains about 400,000 definitions of medical terms, various diseases, um, relationships between these diseases. And it's used in um, these countries, including the UK, for annotating medical records. So when you actually go to your GP and he's actually coding what's, uh, what's wrong with, um, with you, uh, then he, they're doing it using terms from the SNOMED CT ontology. And because it's such a complex um, ontology, it contains lots of classes, lots of complex definitions. Um, so the ontology was developed using reasoning. Um, and reasoning was used mainly to classify and check for equivalences. So you're, it's basically a kind of quality control. Then you've got the Obofundry, which is about um, a repository of about 100 biological and biomedical ontologies. And there are also people are using reasoners to uh, check uh, whether independently developed ontologies can actually be put together without uh, incurring some con kind of contradiction. There is the Biopax ontology, exchange, which is used for exchange of biological pathways data. So on the whole, healthcare and life sciences were one big application areas for this kind of research. So I'm done now with the typical applications. And in this last part of my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the typical research topics, the, 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 the research challenges that we need to address in order to bring this to fruition. And I'm going to tell you then a little bit about what I did and how theory and practice plays a role in, in, in all of that. So I've broadly classified <coughs> the research topics into three groups. The first one is about language and its expressivity. So uh, why do we want to increase the expressivity of the language? Simply because we want to mo be able to model a domain more faithfully. Um, and then when we extend the language, then we want to actually investigate computational properties of this extension, how hard it is to actually process this uh, new language. Another strand of research involves improving scale scalability of ontology systems, which means you want to handle more data and or more complex data. <clears throat> and that involves developing altern alternative reasoning algorithms or optimizing existing algorithms for typical problem instances characterizing sources of complexity, and, and so on. And the final group is um, developing support for common users, user tasks, such as developing actual reasoning systems. Explaining inferences was quite important because it doesn't suffice uh, for a system to just say, Peter is a, par is a person. You want to know how the system actually came to that conclusion. Um, ontology modularization and reuse. So if you have this ontology consisting of 400,000 classes, how do you reuse it in a new context? Ontology mapping, if you have two ontologies talking about similar domains, how do you kind of bridge the gap between the two uh, sets of terms? So in the rest of my talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what I did in this whole landscape. So I'm going to start with these ontologies versus rules. So on the one hand, you had these ontologies and description logics, but then there is another very prominent knowledge representation paradigm based on rules. And you will see an example of a rule shortly, but you can think of a rule as an if-then statement. If these things hold, then something else must be true as well. And there was an even religious debate about which paradigm is better. And this debate actually reminded me when I was at school. Uh, in, in primary school, I had the ZX Spectrum. But there was this guy in my class who had a Commodore. And there was like, you know, we couldn't settle on which one was better. And sometimes, you know, these, these academic debates can go a bit like that as well. So I'm going to now demonstrate the potential problems uh, that you can have based on two examples. So the first one is a biblical example. So we have Cain and Abel, and they're both children of Adam, and Cain hates Abel. And on the other hand, you have Romulus and Remus in exactly the same relationship, but 
for the purposes of this example, let's just pretend that we don't know uh, who their father was. I mean, the father was the god Mars, but let's say that this is one of these blank nodes or one of these X's that I had to introduce during reasoning. So this is my data, and then let's say that we want to state uh, something like a person who hates a sibling is a bad child. So we can express this uh, rule using a rule, uh, which basically we write like this. So we say if X is a father of uh, if X has father Z and Y has father Z and X hates Y, then bad child X. The point is that adding these kinds of rules to ontologies is not necessary. So this kind of stuff you can't write in ontologies. And this is simply because if you could, they could interact. You have to believe me there with these question marks in a really bad way. This is really what makes reasoning undecidable. So this is the actual source of complexity. So it's all about seeing what kind of rules of this form we can add while these question marks <coughs> don't cause us any problem. Um, but then, you know, this means that we have to cut down on the expressivity of the language, but then we can't actually express something and people just want to express what they want to express. So one solution that I proposed was the so-called DL safe rules, which is quite simple actually. So we'll just simply don't apply this rule to these question marks. So this means that in this particular example, we would arrive that Kain is a bad child, but not necessarily Romulus, because this guy here is his unknown name and we don't know, um, you know, we can't apply this rule to, to it. It all gets a bit more technical, but uh, the point is that people actually really liked this solution and it was integrated into all major reasoners out there these days, and it was used quite extensively in practice. Another a uh, problem that arises with ontologies and data expressed uh, in the semantic web, what if we ask the question such as, is Peter a child of Adam? Well, there is no Peter here. I never said anything about this. And if you come from, let's say, databases, then the answer would be no. There is no information about this in databases, in, in a database, so the answer is no. Interestingly, in ontologies, the answer is don't know. This is simply because I never excluded that possibility. This is what is called, more formally, an open world assumption. So things which I don't explicitly exclude could hold. And this is what we've got in mathematics. I mean, we don't know whether P is equal to NP, so we have to assume that we just don't know. Um, the problem with this is that, again, people wanted sometimes this semantics and sometimes that semantics, and there was a lot of work in trying to unify these two views. And in the end, I proposed this so-called MKNF rules. It's, it all gets quite technical, but this was more a theoretic work, which basically integrated then these rules and the ontologies in a coherent framework, so you don't actually have to choose <coughs> and, and struggle which one's better, basically. So another problem that I worked on was integrity constraints. Let's assume that you have an ontology where you say every UK resident has a national insurance number. And then your data says Peter is a UK resident and Paul is a UK resident and here is the national insurance number of Peter, but we don't say anything for Paul. Most people and most users of ontologies would actually say, well, because I haven't specified the national insurance number for Paul, uh, this is somehow incomplete. The ontology says that I have to have the national insurance number. And I mean, you should, I mean this is intuitive for anyone who has ever done any kind of object-oriented modeling. Um, but actually, this ontology specifies more how to complement this information. So this basically means that, okay, well, if Paul has to have a national insurance number, let me invent one and again get this question mark. Now, Again, it gets a bit more complicated, so you'll have to believe me that this makes sense when you're reasoning about classes, but it doesn't make sense necessarily when you're reasoning about data. So what I did is I proposed an approach for integrity constraints that will integrate both this class-based reasoning and data reasoning. And again, this was inspired by simply looking at the practical cases, looking at what people really wanted, going back to the theoretical drawing board and coming up with a solution that will then work in practice. <clears throat> Another problem that I looked into is 
representing stru so-called structured objects. So quite a lot, as we saw in ontologies, is about modeling anatomical constructs. So for example, people try to model the human heart, and this was taken from the Galen ontology, which is like one big ontology of human anatomy. So the left side of the heart has uh, as a component the aortic valve, which uh, is connected to the left ventricle, which is connected to the mitral valve, and which basically is a component of the left side. So this is something that you would want to maybe state if you're representing the heart. And you can do that using these axioms on the right-hand side, which basically say if something is a left side, then it has a component, which is the aortic valve, and if something is a mitral valve, then it's a part of, it's a component of the left side, and, and so on. Unfortunately, it turns out that these axioms, which are quite natural, I mean, you probably can't really appreciate that this really is a natural translation of, of this picture, but please believe me, it is. This is how it was done in this particular ontology. These axioms really describe a structure like this. Um, if there is a left side, then it has a component aortic valve, which has a component a left ventricle, which is a uh, then connected to the mitral valve, which again goes to some other left side. Again, reasons for this are quite complicated, but maybe just very intuitively. The problem is that these axioms here describe left side from one point of view, from the point of view of the left side, and they don't describe the structure as a whole. So they somehow give you point-wise connections, but they never say that this structure as a whole has to have this ring structure. So, you know, people used ontologies, and this is actually what these ontologies meant, um, and that was a problem because on the one hand, they didn't, the ontology doesn't really represent the structure of a heart as we know it. And on the other hand, <clears throat> the reasoners who had to process these kinds of ontologies struggled because they have repetition of lots of, of objects here. So what I did is I proposed description graphs, which is an extension to the ontology language which uh, addresses these issues. Another um, piece of work that I was involved with uh, already during my PhD was an alternative reasoning algorithm um, the motivation for this was that we have databases. Databases are systems that can handle lots of data very well. We can add deductive to it, which basically means that they can also do deduction, this kind of reasoning, over lots of data. And my idea was, well, okay, if databases are really good on that, let's try to use them for ontology reasoning. And as a result, what I did is I developed a reduction of ontology reasoning to query answering and deductive databases. So this basically means we take an ontology, we push it through some procedure, we turn the crank handle, and out comes a, what we call a disjunctive data log program. And then you can feed that into a deductive database and everything's great. Um, this was then realized in the so-called k 2 reasoner, which is a system I developed during my PhD, and that was later sold to a company called Enterprise, uh, who actually used it in, in, in a practical setting. I already mentioned the hyper-tableau algorithm, so quite a lot of our work at Oxford was involved in developing this algorithm. Big uh, uh, aspect of this algorithm is that it minimizes non-determinism. So <clears throat> if you remember uh, when I showed you an example of, the of, of how this algorithm works, you sometimes have to do this reasoning by case. You have to make an assumption either this happens or that happens. Well, in a particular way, this algorithm minimizes this need for making these kinds of guesses. And because of that, the algorithm tends to be more efficient on, on lots of ontologies in practice. The algorithm was implemented in a reasoner that we called Hermit. We maintain it and uh, develop it further at, at our lab in Oxford. It's, uh, I would say, the only reasoner that fully conforms to the OWL language, and maybe I have a head start there because I wrote the specification, so you know, I at least know what's in there and how it's really supposed to work. Um, it was integrated with the Protege ontology editor, and uh, that's basically a system that has over 230,000 uh, uh, 230, registered users, and all of them then get 
a copy of Hermit, a lot of them actually use it to check uh, their ontologies and so on. And we used the system in industry projects such as the EDF's Energy Advisor. Um, a project that I'm currently working on, and we've just submitted the paper on this, was <clears throat> called RDF Fox. So it's a new reasoner, a new system, and this one is in, in particular designed to store lots and lots of data, but it was inspired by two trends in hardware development. So RAM is getting cheaper and cheaper, so the idea is that you can put a lot of data into RAM, I've got in my office a machine with 128 gigabytes and it was only 5,000 pounds. So it's not really a lot and you can do a lot with 128 gigabytes. And, in, and also in, on that machine I've got hun, uh, 16 cores, I think. Uh, so the idea was to use these multi, multiprocessor systems better to optimize reasoning because reasoning is so hard. So the idea is that if you use more cores, it's going to get uh, shorter. And uh, so this system actually turned out quite interesting. So what you see here is the speed up of reasoning with respect to the number of cores. So on the x-axis is the number of cores and on the y-axis is the speed up. So what does this mean? If I have two cores, ideally I would like my uh, <coughs> process to go twice as fast. Now obviously this never really works like that. Um, because there is always some interference between the cores. But what we can see here is that in some cases we got a speed up of something like 19, for example, with 32 cores, which actually is quite impressive. So if you put this into formulae, we managed to parallelize between 88 and 98 percent of the work. So, you know, that's, um, well, we'll see uh, what they say at the conference where we submitted it. Um, another uh, and again, you know, this, was, this involved developing a new algorithm, but also, on the other hand, not just doing theoretical work, I really had to read machine code and see why is it going like this. I had to think about you know, CPU caches and how they are actually transported between different cores in a machine. So again, whole range from theory to practice. <clears throat> Within this RDFOX project, Another strand of research that we are doing is uh, evaluating complex queries. Now, query evaluation is actually an NP-hard problem already in databases. There is nothing we can do about this. It's just a hard problem. Now, in databases, this is not really a, a big issue because queries tend to be small. You have like two or three joins, and in the end, you know, you have lots of heuristics that make things work well. In these kinds of systems, queries become suddenly very large, partly because you have very little bits of information. You have all these arcs, and to actually retrieve any useful information, you have to cross a lot of these arcs, and that basically means that you have lots of joins over, the, over this graph. And suddenly, this NP-hardness comes and bites you, basically. So this, this uh, intractability result really becomes important. Now, the theoreticians have been working for the past 10 or so years, or even more, on a particular measure called tree width. So you have a query, you can measure how close this query is to a tree. So this is very roughly, there is a lot of theory behind it. And if this number is small, then you can prove, actually, that query evaluation shouldn't be too hard, should be polynomial in that number. But this is, this was purely theoretic, theoretical work. Um, there is one practical paper which, in my opinion, doesn't really conclusively show the benefits of that approach. So what we are doing is we are trying to take these results and actually make them practicable. And what we saw is that they actually can make our system run much faster, um, but the problem is that on simple queries, it's not as good as the existing system. So what we are still, I mean, this is still work in progress, so we still need to refine the theory to actually fit with the practice and come up with something that's actually going to solve the practical problems. And to conclude, so information systems are, uh, are currently facing very tough challenges that I firmly believe can be solved only by integrating theory and practice. Now, apart from research, you know, um, I also have to do some kind of university education and we should ask ourselves, what can we do as educators to foster this uh, combination of both theory and practice? 
And in particular, what I find very important um, is we should insist on good, solid foundations in uh, formal computer science. Unfortunately, these things tend to kind of be lost from the curriculum, which is really unfortunate. I mean, we should fo insist on discrete mathematics, set theory, automata, mathematical logic, foundations of programming, database theory. This is really the bread and butter. This is what will enable <coughs> future engineers and, and uh, researchers to actually solve these kinds of problems. And what I find is also really important, we shouldn't insist on this dumbing down. I mean, things somehow tend to get simpler and simpler as, as times go by, and I'm quite strongly against that. We should keep all the technical details. Yes, it's hard, but you know, they should get their degree for something in the end. But on the other hand, <coughs> which is a bit difficult if you're made to pay 9,000 pounds per year, but okay, let's leave that on the side. <laughs> um, but you know, a dry, and, uh, a dry presentation style is going to be counterproductive. So we need to find a way to bring these practical aspects into these, uh, into these courses. Now I was thinking about how we could do that and maybe you know, the idea is to get the theoreticians in a department to teach practical courses and get the practitioners to teach theoretical courses. I don't know, this might be quite a cruel way of really you know, improving the quality of our education. And just to summarize, I really believe that we need to raise a generation of scruffy needs. And on that note, uh, I will conclude here. So thank you very much for your attention.